Hey guys, this is Gonzalez here, uh, about to talk about Intro to Pulmonary Disease. Uh, this is a lecture for the pulmonary module of Intro to Clinical Medicine. Uh, we will be starting our module in September on the 19th. And so this is just kind of an introduction to pulmonary medicine and just kind of a few things that I want you to know prior to us getting into uh, our topics. Here is our itinerary for the module. Um, I am approaching pulmonary medicine by uh, disease process. So you'll see infections are first, then obstructive, restrictive, vascular lung conditions, pleural disorders, uh, and then I'm adding TB, which is infectious. I'm going to add it in here. Then we're going to do some lung tumors and then kind of throw in a grab bag of uh, respiratory conditions here towards the end. I always have a test review uh, where I do kind of a Jeopardy style question and answer session and um, somewhere in this module we'll have Dr. Hidalgo come and talk to us about uh, pediatric cough and we'll do some TBL on that. And then our test is on Black Monday which is going to be on October 8th. So how to prepare for my class. Every instructor that you have for Intro to Clinical Medicine is going to teach a little bit differently. And so my best advice to you are the following. First, I cannot tell you how to study for class. I can't. I, everybody learns differently, just like we all took the learning style inventories. Everybody learns differently, so I can't tell you specifically how to study for my class. What I can tell you is that there's multiple ways to get the same information on my Blackboard site. I take a lot of pride in being organized, and so you'll see that each uh, topic in my module is going to be organized in the same fashion. I'm going to have reading assignments from both Harrison's and Current, and then I'm going to have uh, possibly some integrity lectures. If not, I will have PowerPoints for each of the topics. Then I'll also have some supplemental videos from YouTube, uh, tutorials, etc. And it'll all be kind of organized in a fashion where you can pick and choose what you want to um, to study the day or a few days prior to the lecture. Um, the resources that I post, I, like I said before, they're not me meant to overwhelm you. I mean, when you see all these different things like, whoa, she wants us to read all of this stuff. No, I just want you to be able to understand the material and to have multiple ways of learning it. Uh, choose the way that works best with your learning style. And whichever way you choose to study the information, just be sure you can answer objectives and apply your knowledge clinically, because that's what we want. We want you to read about the material, read about these diseases, and then come in. We're going we're gonna to give you cases. You're going to go through, and you're going to have to apply that knowledge that you've learned. And we'll be using active learning in every single one of, uh, of our lectures uh, for the pulmonary module. Uh, one other thing, do not just study my PowerPoints. They're a tool to help you organize yourself and understand kind of what I feel are the more important points, but they're not all-inclusive. Um, they don't have everything. on. I cannot fit everything on a PowerPoint slide. So don't just study my PowerPoints. That is not an effective way uh, to prepare yourself for class. Okay, so today, what we're going to cover in this uh, integrity lecture are a few things. First, pulmonary terminology. You know, when we start getting into the cases, like I said earlier, we're going to have this terminology, and if we don't understand it, we're going to be Googling, and we're going to lose time in really getting into the case by um, trying to learn this vocabulary. So we're going to go through a few of the basic ter uh, pulmonary terminology, and then we're going to talk about the approach to the pulmonary patient. When we see a patient coming into the clinic, whether it be the ER or a family practice clinic or any clinic for that, for that matter, um, we're going to learn how to approach that patient that comes in with pulmonary chief complaints. So we talked about chief complaints, meaning in the patient's words, why they're coming in to see you today. And so we're going to take those chief complaints, the common ones that people come in that are pulmonary related typically, and we're going to figure out what is important that we acquire from that history, kind of the, the HPI, the past medical history, stuff we've been talking about in medical Spanish, we're going to talk about it in relation to uh, the pulmonary patient. Uh, and then we're going to go into some of the basic physical exam things that help us narrow down our differential diagnosis, which is the list of things that it could possibly be based on the chief complaint. 
Uh, we're also going to go into what we call adventitious lung sounds, which are not supposed to be there. Uh, and then uh, some other uh, important physical exam findings. Uh, then we'll pull it all together. We'll talk about how we use certain imaging uh, in the pulmonary patient, such as chest x-rays, CT scans, etc. And then at the very end, we'll kind of uh, rein it back into to narrowing down the differential based on what we uh, find in the history and the physical exam. All right, so some basic pulmonary uh, terminology. Let's start with first, hypoxia. Hypoxia is basically a deprivation of oxygen. So when we get our vital signs, when a patient comes in to visit you, we'll do what's called a pulse oximetry reading. And what that does is it, it records the amount of, of oxygen saturation in your blood. And a low oxygen saturation is equivalent to hypoxic, someone who doesn't have enough oxygen in their body. Um, let's see, cyanosis. Cyanosis is a word, if we see that word, it's a discoloration of the skin or the mucous membranes due to a low oxygen saturation. So you see that patient, especially like pediatric patients, that are you know really working to breathe and they'll start to get that bluish color around their lips. That's cyanosis. Tachypnea. Tachypnea is a relative word, meaning uh, tachypnea for a one-year-old is not the same as tachypnea for a adult, for an 18-year-old. And uh, basically what it means is rapid breathing. And rapid breathing can mean different things. So in an adult, as we see here, 20 breaths per minute in an adult or greater than that is considered tachypnea, or the patient is tachypnic. Uh, a respiratory rate uh, in kids can be anywhere, especially babies, can be anywhere up to 44 breaths per minute. And, you know, later on, you'll, you'll get um, classifications for like, you know, a few months is this, and then uh, a couple years is this, and then three to four years is this, and a full-blown adult is this. And there's some charts that you can go through that'll kind of lay out the normal vital signs or the normal um, breaths per minute for the age of the patient. Hypopnea. That essentially means a low respiratory rate or shallow breathing. So it's not it's not referring to how much oxygen is in the blood, like hypoxia. It's referring to how how s breathing slowly or breathing shallowly. Okay, that's that's what hypopnea means. Uh, apnea. Apnea is a temporary cessation of breathing. So if you think of like sleep apnea, when people go when they're asleep and they go periods of time without breathing and then they breathe again. Uh, so that's what apnea means. And the last one I have on here, oh, not the last one, second to last one, dyspnea. Dyspnea means difficult or labored breathing. Someone that's having difficulty breathing, that's dyspnea, or the patient is dyspneic. Uh, last, uh, I have hemoptysis. Hemoptysis is essentially coughing up blood. It's not throwing up blood, because throwing up blood is hematemesis, but hemoptysis is coughing up blood. So if you see any of these vocabularies in a clinical vignette, now you know, like, okay, I know what they mean when they say this term. Next, so the approach to the pulmonary patient. So the patient's going to come into your ER, your clinic, and they're going to say, uh, you know, uh, PA Gonzalez, I have shortness of breath. Okay, so we know that's why they're coming in to see us. And so the chief complainer, how the patient presents is what they're coming in with. And so there's several different chief complaints that are that we see very frequently in the pulmonary patient. And so we'll go through those. Uh, some of the main ones we'll see is dyspnea or shortness of breath. We'll see that very often in a lot of the different disease processes uh, that are pulmonary related. Uh, the next one that we see often is cough. Cough. It can be acute cough, chronic cough, uh, cough with sputum, cough without sputum. There's a lot of different ways to describe a cough. Another common chief complaint is hemoptysis. You know, uh, doc or PA, I'm coughing up blood. And that's what brings them to your office. Uh, next, chest pain. Pleuritic chest pain versus regular chest pain. Chest pain in general can be related to a pulmonary patient. Abnormal chest radiography. Sometimes they'll come in and say, you know, uh, I was at my primary care doctor and they saw something on my chest x-ray that looked abnormal and that's why I'm here. So there's other reasons why patients will come in, uh, but these are the main ones that p patients come in with that you want to start thinking pulmonary. Does that mean that every patient that comes in with chest pain is going to be a pulmonary patient? No, no, definitely not. There are other 
um, you know, organ systems or other uh, medicine systems that can cause the same chief complaint. But in general, when we're thinking about the approach to the patient, these are the typical chief complaints that patients are going to come in with when, when we're considering them pulmonary patients. So a differential diagnosis, like we said, we get a chief complaint, and before we get any history, before we start asking them any questions, automatically, and it will become automatic as you get some experience in this, automatically you're going to start listing off in your head what are the different things that can cause this chief complaint. And, and as, you're, as soon as you see that chief complaint, your brain is starting to brainstorm. Okay, so the patient's coming in with a cough. I'm already thinking of a hundred different things. It can be bronchitis, it can be pneumonia, it can be croup, it can be, you know, a number of different things. And right now, you guys are brand new. This is your third, fourth day in the PA program. So you're not going to have a lot of things on your differential because we haven't taught you about them yet. You might have some from experience. You might say, oh, well, I have asthma and I've coughed with asthma, so it could be asthma. Definitely. Uh, but as we go through the module, my goal is to get you to build up that differential, to, to see a chief complaint, see a clinical vignette, and then work through it in your head and say, okay, it could be all these different things, and these are the questions I need to ask to rule this out or to rule this in. And that's kind of the thought process that I'm going to try to help you gain throughout our module. So, like I said, the list might not be uh, long or comprehensive now, but at the end of the module, it should be. When evaluating a patient with shortness of breath or cough, you first got to figure out the timing. Kind of like when we started talking about locates or the, uh, determining the history of present illness. One of the first things we need to ask is, how long has this symptom been going on? Because in our heads, something that's acute in seconds to days is going to be a complete different differential as a chronic issue months to years and so that's one of the first things I start thinking of as a clinician is how long have they had this you know if it's been a couple days there's a whole different set of things like probably bronchitis or allergies or um, an asthma exacerbation whereas something chronic is probably more like you know COPD or or chronic asthma or something more along those lines uh, very rarely are you going to see a viral infection that's going to cause a chronic cough, you know. So that's just kind of how we should start approaching the patient as they come in. Also, like I said before, when you keep in mind that not all complaints of dyspnea or cough are going to have a pulmonary etiology. Sometimes a patient's going to come in with a cough and you're going to exhaust all of your differential. You're going to say you've ruled in or out all these different things. You've given them these medications and it's not getting better. And so you have to start thinking outside the box. And then you might uh, determine that they have a cough because they have uh, gastric, uh, gastroesophageal reflux. They have GERD. And so that the, the acid is coming up and, and triggering the cough. So you have to start thinking outside of the box as well when we're thinking about these chief complaints. Okay, so approaching the patient with dyspnea. We're going to go through each chief complaint. We're going to talk about each one. So... What is dyspnea? How is a patient going to present to the ER with dyspnea? You know, some patients are going to describe it in different ways. So they're going to say, you know, oh, you know, I really feel this chest tightness, or I can't catch my breath, or I can't take a deep breath. You know, and some patients with like congestive heart failure might say something more like, I just, I'm hungry, I'm air hungry. You know, they have this air hunger or suffocating. These different ways that they'll describe it. They won't come in and say, you know, hey, P.A. Gonzalez, I got dyspnea. No, they're not going to say that. But that's what we have to ascertain by the, the common terms that they're going to use. And so basically it's an abnormality, an uncomfortable awareness of breathing. And so it's, the intensity can be quantified by establishing the amount of physical exertion that you need to produce the sensation. So does it happen at rest? If you have dyspnea at rest, that's pretty bad. Now, if you only get dyspneic when you're exerting yourself, then it's a little bit different. It's maybe not as severe. And so another thing that we talked about before, timing is going to be key with patients with dyspnea and when we're forming our differential diagnosis. So if we're thinking acute dyspnea, 
we're thinking something like acute asthma attacks, acute pulmonary edema, acute uh, pulmonary embolism, a pneumothorax, acute infection. And so our differential is going to be different in that compartment if it's, if it's acute, which is seconds to days, right? Then we get into the subacute uh, category. This one's a little bit a gray area. You know, some things can present in this area that might present in the acute or the chronic. And so in this area, we're talking about, you know, an exacerbation of a pre-existing condition. Uh, some other inf infection, inflammatory process. There's some other things, chronic cardiac disease, pleural disease. Uh, those are the, the things that are going to fall into that subacute category. And then chronic, like we were saying, COPD, chronic asthma, chronic cardiac disease, chronic interstitial lung disease, chronic restrictive lung disease. Those are the things that are going to be causing dyspnea. And you'll notice that the majority of these are going to have the word chronic associated with it, right? All right. So next, approach to the patient with cough. So cough generally indicates the disease of the respiratory system. Usually when the patient comes in with cough, it's usually something respiratory. There are other things that can cause cough like we talked about earlier, but most of the time it's going to be pulmonary in origin. So the clinician first needs to inquire about the duration of the cough. You know, is as with dyspnea, you know, timing is key. So is it less than three weeks? Is it acute? Is it three to eight weeks, kind of the subacute process? Or is it greater than eight weeks? Is it chronic? Uh, another thing that we want to ascertain when we're asking our patients questions is uh, the sputum quantity, the character of the cough. Is it a dry cough? Is it a wet cough? If it produces sputum, is it green? Is it yellow? Is it clear? You know, we want to ask all these questions. We want to get as much information as we can about the cough. Another important question to consider is the presence of fever. Do, do you have a fever with it? If you have a fever with the cough, more than likely it's an infectious process. Do you have wheezing associated with it? Uh, wheezing, you know, we automatically think asthma when we think wheezing. Now, and not everything that wheezes is asthma, but we can start there and then kind of ask questions uh, based on that. Another question is temporal or seasonal pattern. Does it happen only, you know, in the dry months of the year? Does it happen in the winter? Does it happen, um, you know, when the uh, seasons change, when the allergens are high and, and the pollens are high? Those kind of things. Um, other risk factors for underlying disease, you know, cardiac risk factors, uh, overweight, those kind of things, smoking, uh, social history, past medical history, uh, you want to ask all those questions with a patient with a cough. Do they have a history of asthma? Do they have a history of COPD? Um, other questions. Uh, kind of trying to figure out if the process is an upper airway issue, like a sinusitis or a tracheitis, or a lower airway issue with bronchitis, bronchiectasis, uh, lung parenchymal infections like pneumonia. Uh, all, the quantity and the quality of the sputum like we talked about. You also want to ask about blood-tinged sputum. And so as clinicians, we're investigators. We get really nosy. And it's funny because uh, when I'm talking to my friends just over lunch, I ask a lot of questions in general. I don't know if it's if I've always been that way or just since I've been a PA, but I ask a lot of questions. If they tell me they have a new boyfriend, well, who is this guy? Where did you meet him? How long have you known him? Does he go to church? Is he a good guy? How's his family? You know, I ask a million questions because I want to know. And that's the only way we're going to know is if we ask our patients questions. And so this is just kind of a, a brief, you know, bird's eye view at what we're going to need to ask when a patient comes in with a cough. Other things, let's see. If an acute cough is associated with fever, like we said, it's, it's more than likely an infection. A change in sputum character, like color or volume, color or volume with like a smoker's cough, might mean like, okay, well, I'm a, I'm a smoker, I have COPD, and I cough all the time, and I have a little bit of sputum, but now my sputum is green, and it's usually just this clear color, or I have excessive amounts of sputum. You know, and so that might warrant more of an investigation. Changing is from the norm, right? Uh, and every patient's norm is going to be different. Then a seasonal cough might mean, you know, an asthma or an allergic type cough, right? Uh, environmental exposures might mean an occupational asthma, interstitial lung disease, like a, um, an, a, a coal miner's disease. You know, you want to ask about those kind of things, exposures to things. Um... Cough with a normal chest x-ray might 
might be like a post-nasal drip that's causing the cough. You just never know. A nocturnal cough might be related to GERD acid reflux because we're laying flat at night and the acid is running up and tickling the back of our throat, causing irritation. Um, productive cough, like smoking cigarettes, uh, chronic bronchitis, um, other kinds of uh, pneumonias and infections can cause um, productive coughs, right? And then there's also drugs that can cause coughs, like ACE inhibitors. So you might exhaust your chief com your chief complaint. You might ask them everything. You're just like, well, I just cannot figure out what's causing this patient's cough. Then you get down to asking them about their medications, and they just got started on an ACE inhibitor. And then you're like, aha, uh -huh, that's probably what's causing their cough. So um, we're just getting you to think about the different things that can cause this cough, and, and how you ask the question helps you figure out what is causing the cough. Hemoptysis, or coughing up blood, right? So it includes both blood-tinged sputum or streaked sputum all the way up to coughing up gross blood, right? And so the most common cause of hemoptysis is bronchitis. What do you think of when you think of coughing up bloody sputum? I don't know, in, in my brain I'm thinking, oh, the patient has tuberculosis or something because you see all these movies where these patients just start coughing and then they have a, you know, a, a handkerchief and it's covered in blood or sometimes I think of like lung cancers that cause um, hemoptysis, right? Um, like it says there, neoplasms can cause, uh, particularly in smokers. Uh, another thing you want to think of is, is this hemoptysis coupled with other symptoms that suggest neoplastic disease? Like weight loss, anorexia. Uh, and anorexia doesn't just mean you don't want to eat. It means you just don't have the urge to eat. Um, smoking history, those kind of things are going to suggest a carcinoma, right? Um, and it's also essential to determine whether this blood is truly from the respiratory tract because sometimes epistaxis or bleeding from the nasopharynx can produce something similar to hemoptysis, right? It can, if the blood is draining down the back of the nose and into the throat and they're coughing, that might be perceived as coughing up blood when it's actually coming from the nasopharynx. Same thing goes for hematemesis. If you're of throwing up blood and you're coughing when you're throwing up it might seem like the blood is coming from the respiratory tract when in fact it's coming from the gastrointestinal tract so that's another important thing to ascertain when you're asking these questions and investigating your patient's symptoms additional symptoms just kind of some afterthoughts when it comes to symptoms chest pain um, that's not an afterthought it's a very common chief complaint especially in the emergency department chest pain chest discomfort chest tightness um, they can be related to respiratory, sometimes they're uh, cardiac, sometimes there's other, gastrointestinal can cause chest pain. Uh, so musculoskeletal can cause chest pain, but we need to consider uh, the respiratory causes when we're thinking about chest pain, right? Often chest pain or pulmonary related uh, chest pain is going to be pleuritic type chest pain. And when we say pleuritic, we mean uh, like the lung lining type chest pain, so it hurts worse with inspiration. Um, so taking a deep breath makes it hurt. That's pleuritic type chest pain. Um, uh, a heart attack is not going to typically present with a pleuritic type chest pain, whereas a pulmonary fusion or a pulmonary embolism is going to present with a pleuritic type chest pain. Patients also report wheezing. So wheezing can be the chief complaint. They say, my kid is breathing and is making a lot of noise when he breathes. Um, so that would suggest some sort of airway disease or constriction, right? Um, let's see. Next, so core pulmonary symptoms. So this is kind of a failure, a heart, a heart failure or a lung, a lung disease that causes a failure of the right side of the heart. They'll present with symptoms of like abdominal bloating, distension, pedal edema, kind of the symptoms you get when you get back up. Of the blood supply um, and we'll go into that further when we get into our, our uh, vascular lung conditions so getting into we've done kind of what we would ask in the HPI now we're going to go through social history so social history is an essential component uh, in the evaluation of patients with respiratory disease all patients should be asked about current or previous cigarette smoking that's a given right this exposure is associated with tons of respiratory uh, system diseases, most notably COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder, 
uh, and uh, the bronchogenic lung cancers, right? Uh, most disorders, longer duration and greater intensity of exposure to cigarette smoke is going to increase the risk of disease. So your smoking history, and we'll learn how to calculate that, That's gonna, the more you smoke, the more risk of disease that you have. There's also evidence of secondhand smoke being a big risk factor in respiratory tract pathology. And for this reason, you should ask about that. Not Patients are not always going to volunteer this information to you. You have to be a good historian. You have to be a good history taker, right? Uh, so that's cigarette smoking. Secondhand smoke. Other things we need to ask about in social history, we ask about the occupation. So we're going to ask about inhalational exposures, occupational exposures, infectious exposures, right? So it's going to be workplace things. Is there a, a history of exposure to asbestos, to silica dusts? Other things like having pet birds. We might have an exposure to that and get some strange fungal disease, right? So you want to ask those things. Uh, environmental allergens, so like dust mites, allergens like pet dander, cockroaches, pollen, ragweed, uh, other allergens, right? Uh, and then exposure to sick contacts. We want to ask about any exposure to sick contacts, if they, there's a risk of tuberculosis, if um, the patient's siblings are sick, if it's a kid, you know, did, did, is anyone else in the household that's sick? We want to ask those questions. And then travel. So travel is really important because uh, there's predisposition to certain infections of the respiratory tract depending on the region that they went to. And there's certain areas of the world where TB is still very common. And so those are the things we want to ask, right? Excellent. So that's kind of in a nutshell what we want to ask social history-wise that's tailored to pulmonary complaints. Next, past medical history and family history. So we'll go through past medical history first. So we want to ask about any history of coexisting non-respiratory disease or risk factors for previous treatment for such diseases. Uh, so like rheumatic diseases, we want to ask about if they've had some sort of rheumatic disease. Um, neoplastic diseases, uh, impaired diseases, so anything that causes an immunocompromised state. Immunocompromised meaning your defense system's down. So things like leukemia, other, other um, cancers, being on chemotherapy, diabetes puts you as an immunocompromised state, um, anything like that, right? Uh, and then drugs that have been associated, like we said, uh, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, for, for people that have asthma, we don't want to put them on beta blockers. Uh, so we want to ask those things in the past medical history. Uh, family history. We want to ask important things like um, certain genetic diseases, like cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis is genetic, uh, so is alpha-1 antitrypsin, and, and certain asthmas are, are found to be genetic as well. So we want to ask any family history of any type of respiratory condition, right? Good. So now we've done our history. We've taken. We know the chief complaint. We've gone through our HPI. We've done our locates. Right. Uh, we've asked about the past medical history, the social history, and the family history. So we've done our history. Now it's time to start examining the patient. And so a clinician's suspicion of respiratory disease often begins with the vital signs, which is the first part of our assessment and the first part of our physical examination. The respiratory rate is often very informative. So whether it's elevated, tachypnea, or it's depressed, hypopnea, that's an important thing to look at. And honestly, as a emergency room practitioner, the first things that I look at when I look at the patient, I look at the age of the patient, I look at the chief complaint of the patient, and the very next thing I look at are the vital signs, because they're vital. And I know that that's, well, it's kind of silly, you know, vital signs are vital, yeah, whatever, Gonzalez, but really, they are. Um, when you look at the vital signs, you can tell a whole lot about the patient before you even lay eyes on them. And so it starts, your suspicion starts with the vital signs. Um, more specifically for pulmonary conditions, we're going to be looking at the respirations. Uh, we're going to look at the respirations, whether they are regular or irregular. And we're also going to look at if they're fa fast respirations or slow respirations, right? Uh, also, we're going to look at the pulse oximetry, which... We're looking for hypoxemia. Remember, we talked about that in the terminology. Uh, a normal respiratory rate for an adult is going to be anywhere from 14 to 20 breaths per minute. Um, when we talk about tachypnea, we're talking about greater than 20 in an adult. 
uh, anything, a lot of different things can cause you to breathe fast, right? Um, and pulse oximetry, they, they stick a little uh, pulse oximeter on your thumb or your nail, and they read uh, the the pulse ox. And so, um, yeah, you're going to go ahead and start with the vital signs, right? The other thing you're looking for uh, after that is going to be doing your examination, and we'll go through the different components of an examination um, very important that we start with the vital signs. So, in general, since we're starting, we're brand new. Vital signs are going to consist of a blood pressure, a heart rate, a respiratory rate. Uh, and for kids, going to have that the height and the weight. Uh, and then we're going to talk about the pulse oximetry, and I think that's about it. Yes. Oh, and temperature. Temperature is going to be part of your vital signs, and that's another one you want to know for anyone with a pulmonary problem because you want to know if they're febrile or not, right? Good. Okay, so the first first thing we do when we walk in a room is we use our eyes. We inspect. How is the patient looking? Are they, are they tripoding? Are they sitting up in the bed, leaning on their hand, leaning forward, trying to catch their breath? Or are they sitting back in the bed on their cell phone, you know, sipping on some water? You know, that, that, that's going to help us determine the acuity of the situation, right? Um... We're going to inspect their breathing. We're going to see, is it rapid, shallow breathing? Is it small breathing, which is this rapid, large volume breathing uh, like that, that people get in metabolic acidosis? Is it this chain Stokes breathing, which is this rhythmic waxing and waning of the, the breath rate, and the tidal volume? Uh, and they have these brief periods of apnea. So you just, you're looking at your patient. What do you see when you walk in the room? We're also looking at their effort. You know, are they breathing... Think about it. Okay, this whole time I've been lecturing, how many of you guys have had to tell yourselves to breathe? Mm, probably not many of you. We do it kind of subconsciously, huh? But we can also tell ourselves to breathe, which is pretty cool about the respiratory system is that it works on its own, but if we need to, we can kind of take a big deep breath and use our accessory muscles in our diaphragm, right? Um, so we need to see how, what is the effort of breathing? How... How much effort are, is it taking them to take a breath? Um, are they using their accessory muscles? That's a sign of pretty significant pulmonary impairment. If you can see the muscles kind of getting sucked into the chest, into the ribs, or you can see it, um, you know, a, a supraclavicular up here in the in the upper chest, you can see it getting sucked in when they're taking a deep breath in. You're also looking for nasal flaring of the nose in kids or uh, kind of this bobbing of the head. Those things are the things you're looking for immediately when you walk in the room. You're also going to look for chest wall structure. Um, kyphoscoliosis or an abnormality of the, of the spine can also cause some restriction within the lung cavity and that can cause trouble with breathing. You're also looking for tracheal deviation, which is a movement of the trachea to one side or the other, which can be another physical exam finding for certain pathological conditions. These are some YouTube videos that I found to kind of demonstrate different breathing patterns and kind of what you would notice if you walked in the room. So if we have enough time here at the end, I'll come back to this slide and we'll kind of go through these on YouTube. If not, here's the links and you can go through them yourself. After we've inspected, the next thing's going to be palpation and percussion. So palpation is not as commonly used as inspection and auscultation in respiratory conditions, but palpation, we're going to touch the skin. We're going to feel for any subcutaneous air. Subcutaneous air can be found like if someone has a pneumomediastinum or air that gets out of the lung cavities and goes into the skin. Um, we can feel for tactile fermentus. Um, the tactile fremitus is when when we talk, we, if you stick your hand on your chest right now while you're talking, you can feel those little vibrations. That's tactile fremitus. And so depending, you'll feel for that in the physical exam, and patient encounter will teach you how to assess for tactile fremitus. Uh, diagnostically, when we expect fremitus to be symmetrical on both sides, we should feel the same amount of tactile fremitus in each portion of the lungs. And if we find that, that the tactile fermentus is absent, we might think maybe they have fluid there or maybe they have a pneumothorax where they have a collapsed lung on that side and there's no air being circulated through that portion of the lungs. Also, if you have increased tactile fermentus, it might indicate they have some sort of lobar pneumonia, right? 
So these are things that we can assess on physical exam that help us lead us in a direction of a diagnosis. Next, we're going to do percussion. Percussion is kind of an old school technique, but a lot of doctors still use it. Basically, get your hand, and we'll teach you how to do it, and you just percuss. You hit like a percussionist, like a drum. You uh, hit gently on the patient's uh, lung, and you should hear this resonance, this normal sound over the lung fills because it's hollow. You hear there's air in there, so you hear this kind of low-pitched hollow sound when you percuss the lungs. We'll go into this further when you get into a patient encounter, but this is kind of just a brief overview. Next, and probably the most important after inspection, is going to be auscultation, listening with your stethoscope, right? And so there's several lung sounds that we would expect to hear in certain patients that are our pulmonary patients. Vesicular lung sounds are the normal breath sounds that we would hear over healthy lung fields. So when we say vesicular breath sounds, we mean normal. That's normal, okay? Um, they're this muted kind of low-pitched sound. Um, you'll have kind of an inspiration, okay? And it's usually about three to one ratio of inspiration to expiration. And the, the ratio occurs because expiratory sounds normally end well before the actual expiratory phase of re respiration has ceased. Um, then the next sound you might hear is this bronchial or tubular breath sounds. Those are normal finding over the sternum and the manubrium, so upper airway sounds, okay? Tubular breath sounds finding only over the sternal manubrium. So it's like kind of blowing through an air or a tube. And so it's kind of what you would listen to if you listened to when you took a breath over the trachea, kind of in that in that area. Um, and those can be, the bronchial breath sounds can be pathologic if you hear them anywhere other than the sternal manubrial area. Then we get into the abnormal or adventitious breath sounds. And those are, the, these, these are what we're talking about when we talk about adventitious. Um, these are the wheezes. So uh, almost everybody's heard a wheeze before. It's this high-pitched <laughs> breath sound, right? So we think asthma right away when we think wheezing, right? So it's this high-pitched, almost a musical quality, kind of a whistling quality, right? Um, think bronchospasm. Don't think asthma, but think bronchospasm. Think a narrowed airway. So if you think about blowing across a, a bottle, right? Uh, if you take a glass Coke bottle and you blow across the top of it, you're going to hear this whistling sound or a whoo sound, right? The smaller that area gets, the higher pitch the sound will get. And so wheezes are high pitched because there's narrowing of the airways, right? A ronchi are these lower pitched, more snoring type sounds, kind of a gurgly quality to them. And it's going to be more in your larger airways. And a lot of times these will clear after a cough. So you'll hear this kind of sound, and then you'll ask the patient to cough, and when they breathe in again, you won't hear that sound. It doesn't always happen, but that is typically indicative of a ronchi. And then we think about crackles. Crackles, or rails, which is another word for crackles, are these brief, kind of discrete, non-musical sounds with like a popping quality. So we call it kind of like a snap, crackle, pop in the lungs, right? And it's discontinuous. You don't hear it all the time. You hear it kind of here and there. Uh, and so that's crackles. My advice to you, look these lung sounds up on YouTube or wherever you look up stuff and just listen to them. Listen to what they sound like. Also, Google some vesicular lung sounds. And I think in your textbook, the, the current textbook, it has some audio files of normal breath sounds. Because you need to hear a lot of normals to understand abnormal, right? So I love MedComic, um, and I love these little diagrams, these little funny caricatures of, of the different disease processes. These are the adventitious breast sounds, and this is kind of our rails, our, 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 our crackles, and this is the snap, crackle, pop. We see it's discontinuous, right? And then we look, and that's more the bronchiectasis, bronchitis, pneumonia, fibrosis, CHF. Um, that's what we're going to see the rails in. Then we get to the wheezing. You see it's very musical. We see tightening of the airway, right? And we see this guy straining. He's trying to push air out because it's usually an obstructive issue, right? Other airway obstructions, asthma, COPD. And then we see ronchi. We, this guy's asleep because it kind of sounds like they're snoring, right? 
And a lot of times they'll have this kind of mucusy sound where you hear mucus kind of sloshing in the airways. So that usually indicates secretions in the large air airways, right? Right. So it, like I said here, there's the abnormal lung sounds in your laying textbook and current. All right, so auscultation. When auscultating over normal lung fields, the patient's voice is muffled and intelligible. Several terms can be introduced to signify abnormal voice transmission. So if you're listening to their lungs and you're having them say certain phrases like 99, which is something we like to have them say, or 1, 2, 3, E, we have them say those things, then we can hear certain changes on auscultation. So bronchophony indicates that a voice sounds louder than normal, whether or not they are intelligible. So if they're saying 99 and it's louder in one spot than another, that indicates a positive bronchophony. Next is petroliloquy. It's used to indicate that words are intelligible by auscultation and whispered petroliloquy if intelligible even at, it's intelligible even at low spoken sound volumes. So if we have someone whisper, um, petroliloquy is Latin for voice of the chest. And it basically means that if we have a patient whisper, one, two, three, it's more clear than it, than it normally would be, right? Uh, then we go into, uh, let's see, egophony. Egophony is a change in the timbre of the vowel sound of E. So if we have a patient, we have our stethoscope up to their chest, and they say E, it kind of has this nasal quality when we say it. Now, when they say it, if we have a positive egophony, it changes the vowel sound of E to A. Ah. So if we have an E to A ah change or an E to A change, that is indicative of egophony. And egophony is Greek for voice of a goat. E, right? E. So here is what I like to term a money slide. So when I say money slide, I mean it has a lot of information in one place and you should definitely know it. Okay, and so this just kind of lays out all the pertinent physical exam findings for any given pathology. Okay, so you can go through that on your own. Almost done, guys. Bear with me. We're on slide 22 of 28. So diagnostic evaluation. After we've done our physical exam, we have to decide, okay, how are we going to work up our patient? Does our patient need any workup? By a workup, I mean uh, laboratory studies. I mean uh, diagnostic procedures, I mean uh, radiology, uh, any of those things are considered diagnostic evaluations. And so there's different things, there's chest x-rays, there's different other imaging, CTs, MRIs of the chest, pulmonary function testing, which will go into specifically learning how to read the spirometry, learning how to read these values. Um, ABGs, which is arterial blood gas, where they draw arterial blood and they look at it uh, to see what the pH is, to see um, the different um, oxygen concentrations, bicarb, etc. Um, we'll also look at sputum evaluations and what it means. Uh, we'll look at coagulation testing is going to be important for someone with like a pulmonary embolism or someone with certain uh, conditions that make them predisposed to having blood clots, right? Um, bronchoscopy or bronchial, bronchioalveolar lavage, we're going to look into that. EKGs are going to be important in patients with, with uh, shortness of breath or chest pain, and other tests that we'll go into, lung biopsies, etc. And really, these are chief complaint specific, so when we get into that, each chief complaint will go through which are, are pertinent to those chief complaints. So as far as chest x-rays, this is going to be almost... I'm not going to say always, but most of the time is going to be the initial diagnostic study of choice to evaluate respiratory symptoms. So when patients come in, uh, most of the time, not all the time, they have to have an indication, but we're going to get a lot out of a chest x-ray. And chest x-rays can also prov provide initial evidence of disease. So sometimes patients will come in with a shortness of breath or a cough to get the chest x-ray. They'll have to get a chest x-ray for something else, and that will be what they come in for because they'll have these incidental findings of a nodule or a mass in, in the chest x-ray, and that warrants a different workup, right? Um, we'll learn more about reading chest x-rays and certain pathological findings on chest x-rays when we get into our respiratory, our, our radiology anatomy course. So on Fridays, um, 
we'll have a portion of anatomy, which is radiology anatomy, which is really awesome. You get to go through x-rays and become kind of mini radiologists, right? Another thing that we use is CT scans of the chest. They're more, more sensitive uh, than plain radiography when we're talking about subtle abnormalities. Uh, we use them for pulmonary embolisms. We use them for diagnosing um, neoplasms and things like that. Uh, when we need some, a picture that's more 3D, we take small slices of the picture so we can see them better. Uh, not everybody that comes in with a cough or shortness of breath needs a CT scan, but it's a test that we can utilize when needed. Pulmonary function testing. Like I said, we're going to go through this in detail, uh, but basically it assesses objectively the alteration in the function of the lungs as a result of a respiratory system disease. Um, it helps us quantify the, the forced expiratory flow and assess whether the, the pattern is obstructive versus restrictive. And it also helps us measure lung volume. So in restrictive disorders, we see a decreased lung volume, and so it'll help us determine that uh, as well. Additional diagnostic evaluation. ABG, we talked about that. It measures effects on blood gas and gas exchange. Bronchoscopy. In certain settings, like in the article we gave you, right, we talked about bronchoscopy uh, for foreign body aspirations. Uh, it can be both diagnostic and therapeutic, which is pretty cool. Treatment. So now that we've diagnosed the patient, we've had we started out with this super long list, this long differential, right? And then we've kind of used our history taking, we've used our diagnostic studies to narrow down our list to rule out or rule in certain conditions, and we've come to our diagnosis. Um, we once we have our diagnosis, we know what we need to do to treat the patient. So we'll go through treatments. In, in clinical medicine, we're going to go through some of the treatments. Um, for instance, for pulmonary infections, I will tell you that if they have an atypical pneumonia, we're going to give them a macrolide. But I'm not going to go into, we're going to give them azithromycin, uh, 500 the first day, then 250 for one to four days. I'm not going to get into that detail because that will be covered concurrently in pharmacology. So that's kind of what to expect when it comes to uh, clinical medicine. All right, at this point, if I was in front of you guys, I'd offer up the floor for questions or comments. Um, if you can think of any, jot them down, and I'll answer them tomorrow in class. Um, I hope this kind of gave you a general bird's eye view of what we should expect in, in pulmonary medicine, in intro to clinical medicine pulmonology. I'm super excited to be teaching you guys this. I love clinical medicine because it's what we do. It's what I do. And so just trying to break it down um, into bite-sized pieces, things that you can easily understand and easily put the pieces together to build up these differentials and to understand what's important uh, with each chief complaint. That's my job. My job is to help you remember this and help you be able to apply it. Because you are, now that you're in PA school, all of this stuff that you're learning is not only important for the test that you're about to take, not only important for the pants exam that you will be taking at the end of two and a half years, but this is stuff that you're going to need to know for the rest of your life, for the rest of your career, okay? this What you learn now is going to help you take care of your patients in the future. So learn it well, okay? Don't memorize things just for the sake of the test. Memorize them because you're going to save lives with this information. And I know maybe that's a little dramatic, but it's true. Depending on what you go into, one day you're going to save someone's life because of what you learn and what you retained from what you learned and the effort that you put into to learning this material, you know, this, this is going to mean something to somebody else uh, as well as yourself. You know, it's very fulfilling to be able to help people with the knowledge that you gain. And it's a gift that you guys have been given and to have the intelligence and the knowledge to be able to get into PA school and to use this knowledge that you have to care for others, okay? Um, so real, real, real super quick, let's go back and look at those um, lung sounds real quick. So let's see, here we click asthma, let's see if it brings it up, right? I don't know if we're going to be able to hear it, maybe we will, if I turn up my volume a lot. So warning, you may find this video distressing. Let me pull it up over here, oops, let's pull it up over here.
So this is a kid with asthma, right? 15-year-old Chris is having a severe asthma attack. His immune system has made what could be a fatal mistake. And is shutting down his airways. You'll see retractions in here. You Without see this? Help from the medical team, Chris's body may shut down completely. You can hear the wheezing. The breathing tubes in Chris's chest are squeezing tightly shut and filling with sticky mucus, blocking his vital oxygen supply. If he's not treated soon, he will die. This is a really life-threatening episode of asthma. Asthma is pretty common in our community, and uh, most of the time it's not this life-threatening, but this one is quite serious. Chris's allergic reaction has tricked his immune system into shutting down his airways, blocking vital oxygen to the rest of his body. The drugs are supposed to help the muscles around Chris's airways to relax. But there is a problem. The mucus stops the drugs from reaching his blood supply. Alright, so you guys get the point. I'm going to let you guys watch them. It'll be easier if you watch them on your own. But please, 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 it will help you if you go through and watch um, watch these YouTube videos. I'm serious. It will really help you. I'm not. Maybe on your IRAT it might help you. Maybe with the patient that you see on rotations it might help you. But please go through. Take the effort to watch these, okay? Um, anyways, this is Professor Gonzalez. I hope you've enjoyed the lecture that I have for you. One bit of advice, I know it's a little bit too late, but in the future, uh, you can actually speed up the speed of integrity lecture to go at double time or time and a half uh, so that you can get through it faster. I know 50 minutes of your time is valuable. Another suggestion I can make is if you don't have time, which you need to make time, but if you don't have time, you can uh, play it on the audio version, like when you're riding in the car if you have a commute. Or, um, you know, even listen to it while you're, you know, sitting in the restroom, while you're getting ready in the morning. There's multiple ways you can find time to, to do your integrity lectures. So anyways, I hope this uh, lecture was enjoyable and, um, and or well organized. And I'll see you guys tomorrow morning. I hope you have a good evening.